It's something I've said before this weekend, is that in this case, the fossil fuels industry has acted more scientifically than the scientists themselves, because they did experiments, they did research. What confuses the public? How do they get confused? So they paid money for experiments where they went to American towns and they took polls to get people's opinions before and after they would run newspaper campaigns and other kinds of public relation campaigns to see what most effectively confuses people. And having done those experiments and gotten the results, they then enacted the results and have confused the public in the United States, which is the only area that I know well on this issue. And I think it's the focus of Oreskes' book. But I take it that it's a global campaign. So not only do we have to do this in ways that are uh, technically and logistically difficult, it's simply a problem of scale uh, to change one's entire uh, civilization's infrastructure. So let's say it's different than the problem of ozone layer. It turned out that, that refrigerator coolants needed to be changed or else we were going to kill ourselves. Uh, hilarious but true. And, and so we did it because refrigerator coolant was a small enough uh, industrial chemical to be able to make a complete switch in it and solve the problem of burning up our ozone layer. This done by a sort of science fictional inspection of the, of the uh, atmosphere of Venus. So really the planetary scientists have been already um, justified in their work, like let's go study the other planets and people in uh, New Zealand they call this blue sky research. You know, in other words, irrelevant and crazy research, but on the, uh, on the other hand, it's saved us all from being uh, cooked like bugs, and is a, one of the first examples that you want to give when you're talking about the usefulness of planetary research to human, direct human concerns. So, okay, it's going to be hard, because there's going to be active human resistance to the campaign to do this. And, and therefore, it'll have, it, there, there's going to be need to be an active political campaign to overwhelm this resistance. And you know, the best defense is good offense. And simply going to have to steamroll eventually the fossil fuels industry in the same way that eventually the tobacco industry has been um, overwhelmed in their assertions that tobacco does not kill people. Now we, we say that it does, and we make it illegal for kids, and we go on, and within a certain freedom of action, like if you're an adult and you're stupid enough to want to do this, you can. Um, but in general, it is now widely understood that tobacco kills. And when it's understood widely enough that cancer, that, that carbon kills in the way that we're using it, then there will be changes in public behavior, in private behavior. And, and the job will be accomplished despite the resistance of the uh, paid employees of the fossil fuel industry. And I think it's worth telling this story because I'm assuming everybody already knows it, but it's not true. Everybody doesn't yet know it. They, they don't know the evidence is there. They don't know how conscious the campaign uh, to confuse people on global climate change has been. And the more that you know it, the more that you spread the word, the more uh, cultural change happens by word of mouth, ultimately, by people talking in their families, amongst the friends that you trust enough to have a political argument with, which is a pretty high level of trust, and on it goes like that. And there can be rapid cultural change. The, the, the cultural attitudes between, say, 1928 and 1932, extremely uh, rapid change into a completely different cultural mindset. The same is true between, say, 1978 in 1982, at least in the United States, and I lived through that cultural change myself, and I can tell you it's, it's um, um, confusing and, and a little bit um, dizzying to see how rapidly an entire culture can change its, its fundamental basis of, of operation, of, of, of uh, understanding, I should say. Um, so now let me I'll come to another, I think, super interesting question about this, which is, um, Will we have to give up our privileges as first world people? Here's the thing. You, a lot of people will roughly do math in their head. They'll say there's seven billion of us. And uh, about a third are doing really quite well. About a third are scrabbling along best they can. And about a third are in uh, misery, immiserated, and living on $2 a day or less, and, and struggling day to day to keep enough uh, uh, food, shelter, clothing, water. And so when those of us who are in the top third, and if 
effectively for this audience, including myself, we could say really the top 10th or uh, in certain ways the top 50 of the world population. And then the, the notion is, well, we need to share equally on this planet because, um, well, first of all, it's the just thing to do, the fair thing to do, but of course that's never had any influence on anybody. But now it's the survival thing to do. Um, in that the top uh, part of the pop world population and the bottom part of the world population are the two worst environmental impacts. The top two hyper It's inevitable. And it's not just selfishness, it's also thinking about your kids, about a decent life, etc. Thank God. If, ever, if all seven billion on the planet had to share equally the carbon burn of civilization, then maybe I have to live like a saint, maybe I have to suffer, maybe I don't get to have the same life I had before. And that's almost like reincarnation. It, I mean, we are so, so much interpenetrated by our so social lives, by our societies, that if society changes utterly, you also change utterly, and nobody wants that, because there's a certain desire for continuity of self over time. And it's, so it's frightening. So, the Swiss, being Swiss, practical people, have done this calculation. And it's a 2,000 watts per year per person. And um, I have to say immediately, I don't know what that means in energy terms exactly, but um, it's also been translated into 17,500 kilowatt hours per year. And I know my electrical bill tells me that um, my photovoltaic system on the roof creates about 6,000 kilowatt hours per year. And so I have a way to judge what that means. And the Swiss come to the same conclusion that I did after trying to comprehend these numbers as an English major, and I'm sorry I can't do a better, somebody needs to do a better uh, lecture that actually um, physicalizes what that means in real life terms, but Wikipedia already has an excellent article on this, and, um, and begins to bring it more alive to everyone what it means, but I can give you the short form, it means that it's not that bad. There are prosperous Swiss in Basel and Zurich who are living that life already as an experiment to see what it would feel like. And they have some uh, unnatural advantages of 500 years of European colonialism ripping off the rest of the world and taking it back to Europe and building a really fine infrastructure so that um, you can live in Switzerland without a car, without any problem, and have a wonderful travel life, etc., etc. This is true across most of Europe. So the averages right now, uh, the ordinary European citizen is burning about 6,000 watts a year, the ordinary Swiss citizen 5,000, the ordinary American citizen 12,000, sorry, you know, that's us, that's America for you. Um, the ordinary um, Chinese citizen on the average 1,500 watts a year, um, in India 1,000, and in Bangladesh 300. So this is the spread in case you're thinking about it. And what would be interesting to contemplate immediately in your own life, in the same way that you can get on your bathroom scale and weigh yourself, you can get on the carbon burn scale and weigh yourself. It's not hard. You, you've got your um, odometer for your car. If you've got a car, you've got your bills. You can calculate it pretty damn quickly and easily. Look at what you've got and see whether you can bring it down to the world average and still live the life you want to live. And then it becomes kind of a project, something to enact. You feel a little bit clever, good at tech. Um, so you're doing clean tech, you're doing appropriate technology, you're doing sophisticated living on this planet, and, and living a, an extremely well-fed, well-housed, um, well-educated, and, and, and in essence, a full human life. And yet not doing the American thing of burning six times as much energy as you need to to do that. And in fact, the standard average calculation right now is that U.S. citizens use up 32 times as many resources as the developing world of peasants do. So um, 30 times more resources, and yet not even a, a, a 
not even twice as much happiness because with that hyperconsumption comes craziness, you know, the neuroticism of hyperconsumption that leads to a, a kind of moral obesity so it's that instead of being happier, they're actually crazier. So it isn't even effective. If you say, well, you know, this kind of complacency, well, we burn 32 times as much as you do, but you know what, we're, uh, we're Donald Trump, you know, we're, 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 we're fantastically happy compared to you. But it's a lie. It's actually um, unhealthy. And since health and happiness are almost synonyms, um, that what you're seeing is a hyperconsumption as part of a commodity machine. There is a, 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 an economic engine that is profiting from it. And so both in our production and in our consumption, we're simply rats on a wheel being manipulated by somebody else. We run on our wheel, and, and there's nothing admirable about it. In fact, it's a little bit uh, stupid. So, uh, without wanting to go into too much detail about it, I just want to tell you one of the, the story of my standard lecture to American college audiences that I've been doing now for five years and, and can't stand to do anymore, although it's useful, it's just um, tiresome. But what I would do would be go to a college crowd and explain this situation to them and say, consider what you are. Let's think about what science tells us we are. We're primates. <coughs> We are, as a species, a couple hundred thousand years old. We are 90% genetically the same as the chimpanzees and the other primates in the ape family. We're no different from them in so many ways that you can hardly uh, believe it. But even just as a species of our own, Homo sapiens sapiens, a primate of, uh, of little fur but great cleverness, um, we evolved to do certain things. its current size in about a million years or less, which in evolutionary terms is just spectacular growth. Grown so, so, so fast and so big that it can't grow any bigger or else um, the, the kid can't get through the birth canal. As many moms can tell you, it's already a, a close thing. And um, so this evolutionary growth happened of the brain and, of course, the body that goes along with it, the uprightness, the handedness, the ability to run all day at a very slow pace, but nevertheless, a great endurance, a pretty impressive primate as a group, something like wolves, dangerous in packs, not that dangerous in isolation. So here we are, pack animals with certain abilities that we've evolved to in these last half a million years, and we have not changed even one gene from that point that we were at, say, 50,000 years ago, or or 20,000 years ago, and yet our lifestyle has completely changed utterly. So what's interesting to me, the, the period of evolutionary growth of the brain was actually a super stable lifestyle. Well, you can tell this from the archaeological record, that the Aculean hand axe is a tool that we don't even quite know what this tool was for. It may have been a kind of Swiss army knife that did a lot of different things. There's simply hundreds of thousands of them scattered around the old world, and um, it's, they stayed the same for almost 300,000 years without retaining the tool. And this is a sign that the culture itself was super stable. And maybe there were things changing that we cannot um, find now, like uh, the growth of language. I mean, speculation as to the rapid growth of the brain, because it is kind of a paradox. You know, they, we were living the same every day, and yet the brain was growing like a balloon. Well, I say, accept the paradox and look very closely at how we were living that was so stable and so much um, um, involved with our growth as human beings. And what you see is a very simple list of very simple activities. Walking, talking, um, looking at fire, cooking, um, obviously eating, obviously sex, but also dancing, music, um, you, being outdoors most of every day, um, sleeping on the ground, etc., etc. I've made the Paleolithic list, 